Hello everyone, my name is Ian. You're watching Big Rock Moto, your home for the most detailed motorcycle reviews on the net. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And if you're new here, I hope you'll consider subscribing if you appreciate this kind of content. Now we have to air out the elephants in the room right away. The Royal Enfield Himalayan, it's extremely slow. The brakes are pretty bad. The headlight is basically a candle and the whole bike is based on very dated technology. However, this motorcycle costs only $5,000 brand new. It comes with a three year unlimited mile warranty. It's super easy to service and work on. It has an extremely user friendly low 31 inch seat height. It's comfortable to ride all day. It has a long fuel range. It can go anywhere and it looks amazing and starts conversations everywhere you go. So today we're going in depth and talking about this motorcycle that has captured the hearts and minds of riders all around the world. Here's how I'm gonna structure the review today. We'll start by showing you the riding position and the seat height. Then I'm gonna drop the bike down and lift it up and talk about uh, how easy or not easy it is to lift. Then we're going to talk about the main specs of the bike, the specs you care about. Just briefly, we're gonna take a tour around the bike and show you all the cool features that the bike has. Then we're gonna get it out on the highway. Then we're gonna get it on some dirt trails. Then we're gonna come back here. We're gonna talk about the pros and cons to the bike, the competition, and then we're gonna have some final thoughts. So take the time right now, pause the video, go grab your favorite drink, your favorite snack or bag of chips, because you're about to get a complete thorough education on one of the most interesting models from the fastest growing motorcycle manufacturer in the world right now. Let's ride. All right, so I wanna show you the riding position and the seat height of the Himalayan. But before I do that, I just wanna give a huge thanks to my friend Jesse, who let me borrow this, his personal bike, for this review. And keep in mind that this bike has some miles on it, it's been through some hard use, and it's not totally stock. As we go through the review, I'll point out what things are not factory on the bike. So with that, let's take a look at the riding position and seat height. One of the biggest attractions to the Himalayan is the low seat height. And it's immediately noticeable when I walk up to the bike. The seat is well below my waist. So it's 31.5 inches. I'll put the millimeters here. Jumping on board the bike, what that means is that, so I've taken the bike off the side stand, is it's so easy to reach the ground. The ground is just right there. I feel like I could almost reach out and touch the ground. That's how low this is. For an adventure travel bike, this is one of the lowest, if not the lowest, out there. <coughs> Now in terms of the riding position, <laughs> that's what I get for drinking Monster Energy drink before the review. Um, so in terms of the riding position, you can see that it's a very upright, very neutral riding position. I have quite a bit of leg room, although for me, I would like a little higher seat to give myself a little more leg room. And I should mention my specs, my personal specs, not the bike specs, uh, five foot, 10 inches tall, about 180 centimeters. I have a 32 inch leg inseam. I weigh about 200 pounds or about 90 kilograms. So that gives you a sense of, of me as a rider. Uh, I could use a little more leg room, but it's not bad. The handlebars are in a perfect position and the bike is just overall extremely comfortable to ride because of this just perfectly upright riding position. Now, if you do adventure motorcycling, this is an inevitable situation. The bike's gonna be on the ground and you're gonna to need to lift it up. Now, if you've watched Itchy Boots on her channel, she ran this bike for a couple seasons. You've seen her lift it. It is still a fairly heavy motorcycle and it falls pretty flat to the ground. Right now it's contacting on the handlebars, uh, the shift lever, which I'm gonna show you in a minute, is kind of a problem. And I think on maybe some of the foot pegs. And it is leaking gas, because I can smell the gas. So I think I should probably get this thing uh, upright as soon as we can. So there's a lot of different ways you can lift a motorcycle. We're not getting into that. Um, there's a few methods I use. And the main thing is just protect your back. Don't hurt your back when you're doing this. So it's really not too bad to lift. If the bike is in gear, which it probably is if you've crashed, um, it's a lot easier because then the bike doesn't roll. But let me grab the camera and show you a few issues that we do have with this bike. All right, so here's the picture of the issue that I have. You see how the shifter is bent into the shift arm and it's bent in towards the bike. So the motorcycle, all of its weight was actually resting here on this shift lever, which is a bad situation. So 
I think this is a known issue with these bikes, but something to keep in mind. So because I'm borrowing this bike, I'm definitely gonna try to bend this back out and fix it for him before I give him the bike back. But other than that, um, you know, really no real issues. This bike does have these pannier frames, which I think helps a bit with this bike. I know it was resting on that passenger peg there a little bit. Not too bad to lift. I would give it like a C plus or a B minus on my scale. All right, let's take a tour and talk about the specs, the important specs that you care about. So why don't we start with the engine? So the engine on the Himalayan is a 411 cc single overhead cam air cooled four valve engine. And it puts out about 24 horsepower at the crank or about 18 kilowatts at 6,500 RPM or 23 foot pounds or 32 Newton meters of torque. And that torque comes in at 4,200 RPM. The engine is a very basic old school design. That's part of the bike's attraction, part of its charm, but also part of the reason why it doesn't make very competitive horsepower numbers. Now let me back up just a second and make sure to make clear that this bike is a 2021 model. This is not a brand new bike and as I've mentioned, I borrowed this from my friend Jesse and this bike is not completely stock and I'll try to point out what's not factory when I go through the tour. Now what this bike does have is, is electronic fuel injection versus a carburetor which you might think it has but it's pretty modern with the fuel injection. Now, one potential downside is it's only a five-speed transmission. So instead of most modern motorcycles with a six-speed, you're only getting a five-speed transmission, but with such limited power available, I don't think it makes too huge of a difference. And of course, you can see here, you've got a chain final drive. So this bike has a four gallon fuel tank, which gets you a range of around 150 to 200 miles because the bike gets pretty good mileage, usually around 60 miles a gallon. And when that fuel tank is fully fueled up, this bike is coming in with a wet weight of 439 pounds. Let's talk about the suspension on the Himalayan. So in the front, you have 7.9 inches of travel from a pretty skinny and pretty basic 41 millimeter front fork. And there's no adjustments on the suspension. The rear suspension coming back here, what you can see in here is you've got a mono shock. Now, this bike has an aftermarket Hyper Pro suspension shock on it, so it's not factory. But with a factory suspension, yeah, you've got that seven inches of travel and you get no adjustments with the factory shock. However, this Hyper Pro is a huge improvement on this bike. Let's talk about the brakes. So the brakes are definitely a sore point on the Himalayan with how weak they are. So you have a 300 millimeter front disc and it has a, just a two piston old fashioned caliper. So it's not like most of these bikes you see where you're getting four piston, it's just two piston. And on the back, you also have a single disc with a single piston caliper. The back brake is not so much of a problem. It's the front brake that can feel pretty weak. Wheels and tires, you have spoked wheels for off-road use. Uh, they do have tubes in them. You have a 21 inch front tire and that's a 90 section uh, or 90 width front tire. On the back, it uses a 120 width tire and it's on a, let's see, is it a 17 or an 18 inch? It is a 17 inch rear wheel. One thing I usually like to cover is the ground clearance. So the bike's up on the center stand now, but you should know the ground clearance, what they claim is 8.6 inches. So not a ton of ground clearance, but again, you're getting that super low compact seat height, which makes the bike so friendly for newer riders or for shorter riders. So you are sacrificing some of that ground clearance. All right, now let's talk about maintenance. So what is it gonna be like to live with the Himalayan if you buy one? So the air filter is right here under this left side cover, very easy to get to that air filter. Oil changes are pretty easy to do on this bike, nothing complicated about the oil change, so that's no problem. Now Roy Enfield is calling in the service schedule for an oil change every 10,000 kilometers or about 6,000 miles. Now a lot of owners are gonna change the oil before that because again, it only holds around two liters of oil, so that's up to you, but I probably wouldn't wait 6,000 miles between oil changes on a bike like this. Now we have to talk about valve inspection. So this is one of the uh, only modern motorcycles which a very short valve inspection interval. So they want you to check and adjust the valves which are in here about every 3,000 miles or 5,000 kilometers. Now that sounds like pretty often and it is, but this is an old school engine and that's what these engines need. Now to do that, what you have to do is remove the fuel tank, which is not that hard, pull some inspection covers on the head. You don't have to pull the whole valve cover off and then you have screw adjust valve. So this is something that you can definitely learn to do by yourself. It's not that hard. The tools are not expensive or specialty tools. and 
get you involved in working on your own bike. So I think it's kind of cool, but if you're gonna stack a ton of miles on one of these, you know, you are gonna have to keep that in mind compared to the competition, which doesn't need as often of valve inspections. All right, let's take a tour of the bike starting at the front. So we've talked about wheels and tires. You've got these kind of dual fender arrangements. So you've got kind of this upper beak and then this, this lower fender here. These, all these lights you see, these are not factory. These are aftermarket lights that the owner has put on for extra lighting. Speaking of lights, the stock halogen headlight is like a candle. It's very, very dim and is not doing you a whole lot of good there. Uh, windshield here, um, it was pretty effective. Handguards are aftermarket handguards. It doesn't come with the metal handguards, of course. Working our way around to this side, one of the distinct features of the Himalayan is this sort of upper crash bar, which is a cool place to mount accessories or luggage or gas cans, but you also get the cool Roy Enfield logo on there. Working our way around the right side of the bike, you can see all the engine cases and stuff. They do look a bit old school, a bit budget, but that's again, that's what you're getting at this price point. You can see the exhaust running under here, the uh, oil inspection window, so it's nice you have that instead of a dipstick. This is the aftermarket cover over this uh, rear brake uh, master cylinder there. The factory foot pegs are pretty chintzy looking, to be honest, pretty small. If it was my bike, I'd probably be looking to upgrade that. You can see the rear brake lever. The exhaust also looks like, you know, kind of a budget item, and it has quite a bit of wear on this bike. Passenger foot pegs, and I should mention the frame is all one piece. It's not a bolt-on subframe, and the passenger pegs are welded into the frame. So if you do have any damage back here, you might be looking at getting a whole new frame instead of just bolting on a replacement. The seat, this is the factory seat that really low 31 and a half inch seat height, which is nice. And the seat's relatively comfortable for what it is. Uh, these pannier racks are obviously not standard. Working our way around to the back, you have this little rear luggage rack. You've got the incandescent uh, brake light, turn signals, license plate holders, things like that. Working our way around to this side, you can see the chain guard and the chain final drive and the sprockets and the adjustment for the chain tension, which is something you have to do. We've talked about the suspension already. Uh, I don't know if the center stand is factory, but I'll put that here in the text, but this bike does have the center stand, which is a nice feature. This bike also has an aftermarket skid plate, so this metal skid plate is not factory. You can see there's an oil cooler here to keep your oil cool. It's an air-cooled engine, so there's no radiator, no uh, liquid cooling on this bike. All right, sitting aboard the Himalayan, so what do we have? We have non-adjustable clutch and brake levers. We have pretty budget switch gear, but honestly, it's kind of on par with a lot of more budget Japanese bikes these days. One interesting feature is you do have this kind of enrichener or starting knob. It's not technically a choke because it's fuel injected, but it's more of a high idle to allow the bike to warm up on colder mornings. Uh, this is a... Aftermarket switch, this is not factory. This is for the extra lights that the owner has installed. He also put this ram mount on here. You can see the handlebars. I don't think these are the stock handlebars, but I could be wrong. He's got a power outlet here, which is again, not factory. You can see the key, good old fashioned mechanical key, no fancy key fobs or electronic uh, you know, keys here. The mirrors are pretty budget looking mirrors, but they do the job. You can see this bike has this uh, bar here for the GPS and he has a Zumo XT mount here because he uses the Zumo XT for his bike. Turning the ignition back on, looking at the gauges. I personally really like the style of these gauges. I think they look really cool. Uh, so, and they're very functional. So down here, you've got an LCD screen with a gear indicator or clock. You've got odometers, trip meters, and you can change and kind of cycle through uh, some of this information here. So one of these buttons does it, there you go. Uh, yeah, trip computers, average speed, things like that, pretty useful. You can see the large odometer here. It only goes up to 100 miles per hour, and that's even optimistic because the bike can only go about 70 miles per hour in the real world. You've got some dummy lights here that you would expect. You have a real small tachometer, kind of looks like a clock face. Bike red line to 6,500 RPM. Down here, you have a very useful fuel gauge. I don't know how accurate it is, but it has a nice big sweeping range, so it's pretty, pretty nice to have that. And then you have their signature compass, which is kind of cool to have. Now, the new 2022 bikes have an additional uh, pod that is for the tripper navigation this bike being a 21 does not have that feature all right let's go ahead and ride the royal enfield himalayan beautiful kind of late summer day for a ride temperatures finally cooler around here we had a super heat wave the last couple of weeks and the weather has really been changing for the better which is great so i've changed up some of my riding gear so when you start the Himalayan, you hear the fuel pump prime, just like you expect. See the gauges kind of do their thing. 
Now sometimes you have to use this kind of uh, fast idle thing and sometimes you don't. I'm at high elevation and sometimes this bike just doesn't like to idle, but let's see. Yeah, see, so I'm going to use that. Yeah, so I found that this particular Himalayan does have some idling issues uh, from time to time. Uh, the owner did put the booster plug in, in it, and that may be causing some of it. Or the valves could be a little tight, um, but I've also heard of a lot of other owners having kind of some intermittent starting or idling issues. Of course, it's actually better than that my KTM 890 right there, which half the time in the morning just refuses to start. It takes about eight times. It's very frustrating. So when the Himalayan does start, it settles into a very kind of comforting, kind of lumpy, kind of like uh, throaty idle, just kind of uh, just thumping along, very, very smooth. You don't feel a lot of vibration. You can see the bike moving a little bit like this. Anyway, let's get going. Let's get going on a ride. We've got enough gas. It says we've got just over half a tank, so we'll probably get some gas on the way home. Oh yeah, 80 miles on the tank, so I used my trip meter there. This bike has 6,500 miles on it, and they've been pretty hard miles. Knowing my friend Jesse, this bike's been in Alaska. This bike was actually part of the Alaska film expedition that Royal Enfield did. So it, it's seen some definitely some hard use. A couple things you notice right away with the Himalayan is just how soft the suspension is, which is kind of nice and comfortable, and how low to the ground it is. It's so low. It's one of the lowest seat height bikes that I've ridden recently and it's really comforting just to be able to always have such good footing on the ground. Another thing you notice right away about the Himalayan is it's really quite comfortable bike to ride. The seat is soft initially and eventually it gets uncomfortable because it's a little bit too soft, but um, the riding position is just super comfortable. You have pretty decent wind protection from the standard uh, windshield here. And then we need to start talking, of course, about the engine and the power. So for a single cylinder engine, it's actually very smooth. I would, it has very minimal vibration even it close to redline like this so that's redlining the bike there and it just doesn't vibrate very much you feel a little bit of buzz coming through the seat and you can see the mirrors they kind of vibrate and buzz a little bit but overall it's a pretty smooth ride for a single cylinder bike so with the stock windshield the wind is hitting me about maybe halfway up my helmet visor and so there is a good amount of noise on my helmet, but I wouldn't say it's too turbulent. It's just, there's some wind that you still get. Um, and my shoulders are in the wind, but the, the windshield is keeping the wind like off my torso, which is a pretty nice thing to have. Another thing you notice about the Himalayan right away when you start riding it, it's just so gentle and so docile. It's just like an old friend. It's like, we got this, no problem, just smooth simple there's not a lot going on here the gauges are big and easy to read uh, even when you give it full throttle not much happens which can be a negative or a positive I guess depending on your point of view but for riding on roads like this where you're going you know maybe 50 miles an hour at most uh, the bike is the bike is just fine for this it could do back roads all day long and really that's what this bike is made for now let's talk about the handling so this bike does have hyper pro suspension i've ridden a stock himalayan and the stock suspension is is pretty soft and floaty but it's not terrible i've ridden a lot worse bikes like the uh, bmw 310 gs the honda crf 300l those suspensions are so bad himalayan's not too bad but with this aftermarket hyper pro it's actually f relatively well controlled and it, and it makes the bike handle pretty well so roll on power with the Himalayan. So I'm in fourth gear going about 45 miles per hour. And that's full throttle. There's 50, 55, 60, 65. Now I'm going a little bit downhill as I do this. I'll show you the acceleration and more and more uphill. So now I'm going uphill and if I roll on it's barely accelerating up this hill, 52, 54. <laughs> so with only 24 horsepower, that's the throttle pin there. When you're going uphill, it just doesn't have a lot to give. 
So if we pick up the pace a little bit more, the bike does just fine. Now, let's talk about the brakes. So the brakes are definitely, I mean, that's a hard squeeze on the brakes and it takes forever to stop. That's with two fingers. I use two fingers for braking. Now, if I use my whole hand, I can get things to stop a little bit better, but the brakes are pretty, honestly, they're pretty terrible for a modern motorcycle. And if I owned one of these bikes, one of the things I would consider doing would be to upgrade the braking system somehow. The rear brake is actually pretty powerful, but you know, most of your braking is gonna come from the front and it's, it's pretty bad. Now you do have ABS, which you can turn off there uh, if you need to for off-road. But man, on a day like today, on a road like this, this is an amazing bike for this. I'm having a ton of fun. I feel connected to the machine. I'm comfortable. It, it just, there's nothing wrong with it. And it just connects me to that, just sort of pure joy of motorcycling. And I think of more about the scenery and the ride than I do about, you know, going fast and trying to impress people. And that's what I love about this bike. All right, let's do a little acceleration testing here. Now, I'm at 5,000 feet above sea level. This is a slight downhill. Let's see how we do. Full power. 40. 50. 55. 60. 65. 70. Okay, let's do this going uphill. This is a lot slower. Full power, come on, 35, 40, red line, 50, 55, there's red line, 56, come on, let's get to 60, and there's, there's 60 miles per hour or just under 100 kilometers per hour. So it is very slow, but I wouldn't say that it's like so slow that it's dangerous, at least not in roads like this. Now, we're gonna get to the freeway here in a minute and that will show some of the limitations of this bike. All right, the Achilles heel of the Himalayan, not having enough power for high speed use. So to give you uh, some uh, reference of what we're talking about, in the USA where I live here in the West, Western USA, the freeway traffic a lot, usually moves between 75 to 90 miles per hour. I'll put the kilometers here, but it's a lot. It's fast. And the Himalayan really has a tough time doing that. Now, on this initial run, we're going to be going a bit downhill, and we have a wind behind us pushing us along, so we might be able to maintain pace with traffic. But then I'm going to get off the freeway and come back the other way into the headwind and show you the real limitation of this bike if you want to if you want, need to be able to travel on highways like this without just totally getting run over got to accelerate as quickly as we can here come on come on come on come on the mirrors buzz so much i can barely see what's behind me And I've got the throttle absolutely pinned here. And the bike is indicating around 80 miles per hour. But here's the thing, we're going downhill and we have a wind pushing us from behind. It's not gonna be the case when I get off and turn around the other way. See that Jetta there is doing about 90 and there's no way I can keep pace with them. This guy's doing about 85. giving it all I've got here. 80 miles per hour indicated. I don't know what the actual speed is. I'm also revving the bike very high. It's pretty close to redline. I'm at 6,000 RPM at 75 miles per hour. Now who says the USA doesn't have roundabouts? Occasionally we do, but Americans get very confused by them, as apparently I do too. 
Yeah, stop in the road. That's good. Okay. Full power. Come on, we're gonna need everything this bike has to do this. So now we've got the wind coming at us head on and I'm going a little bit uphill. I've got the throttle, the throttle is pinned here and I'm doing about 60, 65 miles per hour and that's the best I can do. And the traffic up here in the fast lane is definitely getting away from me. But, at least for now, I'm keeping ahead of the semis, barely. Down to 65 now. Still got the throttle up. Now I'm dropping, I've got more of a wind, so now I'm dropping 63 miles per hour. Throttle is all the way open. And now the traffic's just going to go by me. So this is definitely a major limitation for this motorcycle. Well, I'm very happy to be getting off the freeway. It's not the best experience to not be able to keep up with even the moderately paced traffic. So to, I think depending on where in the world you you live, you know, this could be a problem or it could not be a, or it might not be a problem if you live somewhere where there is no there are no freeways that have traffic moving at those kinds of speeds. Yeah, the ABS is still on. Oh well, we'll just have to keep that in mind. So the whole the whole theme with with riding the Himalayan off-road is just exploration, right? It's not going to oh this is very rough. Um these ruts are huge. It's not gonna win any awards, you know. The suspension is very soft. It's pretty heavy. 430 plus pounds is not a dirt bike but here's what it has in its favor it has a very plush comfortable suspension that doesn't beat you up and the whole bike the, it carries all of its weight very very low to the ground so it actually is pretty nimble and pretty agile for uh, the heavy bike that it is and you can just put around and explore these trails all day long and it doesn't stress you out it doesn't feel super tall heavy or tippy and if you need to come to a quick stop and put your foot down the ground is right there like it's not these other bikes that you ride where you're so high in the air that you can't even get a foot down uh, when the going gets tough now a lot of my friends have these bikes i've seen these himalayans do some pretty incredible things so it really just comes down to the rider's confidence and experience. Eventually, yeah, you can't go fast because you run out of suspension travel. You can't go over huge obstacles because, I mean, the ground clearance is a bit limited, to be honest. Um, but if you just want a bike to explore, to see the backcountry, and you're not obsessed with going fast and being competitive, this is an amazing bike for doing that and I truly truly enjoy riding this bike off-road just as much as I do on-road <laughs> because sometimes I just want to chill out and take a look at the world around me and this bike is amazing for doing that that's what's good about these slower motorcycles the the power delivery of the engine is so soft like you can't no matter what you do you you can't get this thing out of shape with with the throttle it just doesn't have it doesn't have enough power you really you really can't even break the rear wheel free if you try maybe a tiny tiny bit if you time it just right um, going through some of these these rougher terrain the long travel suspension just soaks everything up as long as you don't go too fast and it gives me a lot of confidence um, but I'm riding pretty slow you know if you start to ride faster everything really falls apart at that point I haven't talked about the clutch and the shifting very much so the clutch and the shifting is very smooth on this bike very easy clutch pull the gear shifter is super super smooth and that's one thing I really do like about it uh, and first gear here first gear here is so tall that on a trail like this you can 
pretty much stay in first or second and just kind of putt along. The engine makes its torque pretty down low. It's like, a, I guess they call it like a long stroke engine, so you don't have to shift it a lot. Just very lazy. Oh, okay. The bike does not like to be jumped. I can tell you that. But that's not what this bike is for, right? Now, one criticism I do have, when you try to stand up on this bike, and I noticed this the first time I rode a Himalayan years ago, the, the exhaust gets in the way of my heel. So I wear size 12 and a half boots, so pretty big feet. Um, but, trying not to make a joke there. Uh, but the, oh, this is very rutted out here. I have to pay attention for a second. Ugh. But see, I can just put my foot down and sort of paddle through this this stuff um anyway what i was saying when you try to stand up the the exhaust is in the way of your heel so it makes standing very awkward and the foot pegs feel weird just like you can't keep your feet close to the bike and it just feels a bit awkward in my opinion why don't we stop on this steep hill and see how it is to take off so again i can flat foot so easily because the bike's so low and the power delivery and clutch is just so smooth and gentle that it just it just kind of tractors up the hill it's like a little mountain goat didn't even slip out it doesn't have enough horsepower to even really slip out the rear tire so in summary it's a great bike for off-road exploration people have already proven that i'm not the first person to say that you probably already know that just work within its limitations and you can take this thing just about anywhere and in fact i would say that and for many people, this would be a better bike to explore backcountry trails than a full-size adventure bike would, a more expensive adventure bike, because it's cheap, it's relatively light compared to some of those bikes, but the bike is low, the seat's low, you can put your feet down, all the weight is carried low, the power is gentle, and you just can't get yourself into too much trouble, and you end up enjoying the scenery more instead of focusing on, you know, going fast and paying attention to a bike that always wants to kill you. So I really appreciate it for that. All right, we're back. I hope you all enjoyed going on that ride with me on this beautiful late summer or early fall evening. So what are the pros and cons as I see it to the Himalayan? So we're gonna go through these pretty fast because we've really talked through a lot of these through the course of this review already. So what are the pros? To me, the biggest standout pro is how easy and approachable this bike is to ride. I think whether you're an experienced rider with a lot of miles under your belt, or if you're a newer rider, or maybe you're a shorter rider, maybe you're just not as tall as a lot of people, this bike, because of the low seat height and the way it carries its weight low, it's just so easy and approachable to get on and just go for a ride without being intimidated. Going along with that easy to ride character is the power delivery. The power delivery is so gentle, so smooth, so soft, that it's really almost impossible to get this bike out of shape by adding too much throttle because even if you add all the throttle that it has, it still doesn't really do very much for you. And experienced riders will find that to be a bit boring at times, but for newer riders, it's really wonderful how gentle the power is. The next big thing for me is the affordability. For just over $5,000, so for 2022, they increased the price about 300 bucks here in the US. It, this bike is now $52.99. It was $4,999 the year before. This happens to be a 2021 model, so that's what this bike stickered at. But anyway, for that price, uh, for a bike that can do everything this bike does, and with a three-year unlimited mile warranty, which is almost unheard of in the motorcycle industry, this is a hell of a bargain, and it really demands your attention. The next big thing for me, and of course we've covered this, is that you can go anywhere on this bike. Whether you want to do urban riding, whether you want to do a little bit of highway riding, although probably keeping those speeds below about 70 miles per hour, below about 110 kilometers per hour. Whether you want to go off-road on trails or gravel roads, you want to load it up and go touring. It really is an all-purpose, all-surface motorcycle. I won't call it an enduro or a dual sport because it's a bit too big and heavy for that, but it's a comfortable bike you can ride all day on all sorts of varying terrain. And you don't have to hear that from me. You can see that from all the videos and all the people out there in the world using this bike in all sorts of crazy conditions. A couple more things I love about the bike. I love the styling. The bike has so much character. It attracts so much attention and starts so many conversations. And those conversations, those new friends you're gonna make from just strangers on the road, whether you're getting gas or at a little cafe or on your travel, it's so interesting to always talk to people like that. And this bike will start those conversations for you. And the styling, some people don't like it, but I love it. I think it looks incredible. 
and we've already really covered this a lot, but it's very comfortable. The seat is pretty comfortable. The riding position is comfortable. It has pretty good wind protection and the suspension is very plush and smooth. So you don't get beat to death by all the bumps on the highway or in the dirt. And so it's just a comfortable bike to ride for long distances. So what are the downsides to the Himalaya? Now these should kind of be obvious by now if you've watched this video up to this point. One is gonna be the lack of power to travel at higher speeds on the highway. This is only gonna be a downside depending on where in the world you live and how you use your motorcycle. Here in the USA, where I live in the Western USA, freeway traffic travels very, very fast, 80, 90 miles per hour, which is around, I think, 120, 130 kilometers per hour. And this bike really just can't do that. So that could be a problem depending on how you need to use the bike, or it may not be an issue for you at all. You're just gonna have to decide. The next couple things I've, I've touched on a little bit, the brakes are pretty weak. You have to almost use your whole hand, which I'm not used to doing, to grab that front brake to get this bike slowed down. But the bike is not really fast, it's not really heavy, so you can kind of work around that. You'll get used to it, and it's really not a deal breaker issue whatsoever. Plus, I think you could upgrade the brake pads or the brake disc to get a little bit more braking power. The next thing is the stock headlight. I would really like to see Royal Enfield maybe if they tagged on $100 to the bike and gave us an LED headlight with just a bit more lighting because the stock light is pretty poor on this bike. Now, the owner of this bike has put on these aftermarket lights uh, just so he could ride at night without, you know, basically being killed and not being able to see. And that's really about it for the cons. I could nitpick little things here and there. I can nitpick some of the quality issues and some of the build finish issues, but you know what? For $5,000, I'm going to forgive all of that because I don't expect Ducati or BMW levels of fit and finish for $5,000 for a brand new bike. You just can't expect that. All right, so what are the main direct competitors to the Royal Enfield Himalayan and what bike should you be cross shopping this with? Now, keep in mind, I'm here in the United States and we don't get all the brands that some of you do are worldwide. So I may not be mentioning some of those other brands here. That's just because we don't get those bikes. They're not for sale here. So the main bikes that in the US anyway would compete with this bike, BMW G310 GS. I have a full review on that bike. I'll link that somewhere here in the video. The KTM 390 Adventure. I also have a full review on that bike and I'll link that here below. You've also got the CRF 300L Rally from Honda. I'm also doing a long-term video series on that bike, which I'll also try to link here below. So I have reviews on all those bikes. You can go and see their respective pros and cons. How does the Royal Enfield compare? Well, there's kind of some good news and bad news here with the comparison. I think overall, overarching the whole situation is, do you like the way this looks, feels, and sounds? Do you like the idea of Royal Enfield? If you're in love with that, you're gonna buy this bike no matter what I'm about to say. But if you're a bit more logical and a bit more uh, objective and analytical in looking at this, the Royal Enfield, compared to all those bikes I just mentioned, the Royal Enfield is the least powerful and it carries the most amount of weight. So technically, it has the worst power to weight ratio, it's the slowest, and it shouldn't handle as well. However, that's really not the whole story. We've talked about the unique pros to this bike, which make it very unique. But uh, one thing I will say for sure about this bike over those other ones, the seat height on this bike is way lower than any of those other bikes. Um, that's one of the magical things that Royal Enfield has really done here is given us a bike that for shorter riders, for newer riders, uh, or maybe riders who don't have a lot of core strength in their body, this thing is so low to the ground and it just makes it so much less intimidating even than those other bikes that I mentioned. Another benefit to the Royal Enfield is that of all the other bikes I mentioned, this is also the most affordable, and I believe it has the best warranty as well, at least here in the US. BMW does have a three-year warranty, which is pretty comparable with this, um, but, but the warranty is very good on this, and the price is extremely, extremely competitive. So I think you really can't go wrong with this bike if you just understand the limitations that it has. Those other bikes, uh, the 390 Adventure can do basically 100 miles per hour. This thing can go about 70, 75 on a good day. So that's a huge difference in highway performance. The Honda Rally 300L is uh, more capable off-road, better suspension travel. Um, it's, it's really comparable in kind of terms of its comfort and everything. It has a little bit more power, but it's a lot higher off the ground. It's not gonna be as good for those newer riders. The BMW G310 GS, 
Nothing against BMW, I've owned a lot of them, but that bike just feels a bit cheaply built for BMW. And there's just some, the suspension is really bad. The suspension on this bike is actually better than the BMW. So I'm not so sure. I, if you made me choose between this and the G310, I think I would take this. I just have more fun riding this bike. Final thoughts on the Royal Enfield Himalayan. It's probably obvious if you've watched the whole review to this point, how much I really enjoy and appreciate this motorcycle. Now, is this motorcycle for everybody? Absolutely not. Would this be the only bike that I would own that would meet all of my riding needs? No, absolutely not, because I need to travel at faster speeds on the highway, and sometimes I just need quite a bit more performance envelope or threshold than this bike can offer. However, for somebody like me, this would make an amazing second or third or fourth motorcycle just to go for a simple ride and to have fun with. I could see myself going on camping trips with this bike, taking the roads less traveled. Because it's underpowered and slow, you stay off the highway, you stay away from the traffic and you get off on your own. And I think it would make for some very interesting route planning uh, here where I live in the USA. There's just something that about this bike that I really, really connect with. Maybe it's the fact that I'm always riding at full throttle or I'm always using all of its capability, or the fact that you know having to check the valves every 3,000 miles is gonna make you be more involved with your motorcycle and really harkens back to a day when we had to wrench on our own bikes and we had to have that connection with the bike. And on the modern bikes that have so little maintenance and, and they have such high performance, you just get very disconnected uh, from that sort of experience being one with a motorcycle and, and, and sort of having those ownership experiences. You don't get that on a lot of the modern bikes. Plus, because this bike is so slow, you just end up enjoying the ride more. It's more about the scenery, it's more about the ride, the people you're gonna meet, the travels you're gonna have, and the bike just sort of is in the background. It's doing what it needs to do. It'll get you where you wanna go. It doesn't cost a lot of money. You don't care if you crash it or drop it because it's not that expensive. It's not so tall. It's not so fast that you're gonna kill yourself. So. I think it should be obvious, I love this bike. I really would like to add one to my garage. I'm just struggling to justify that based on, I don't know if I really have time to ride it. On paper, when you look at the specs of this bike, it's very unimpressive. However, I encourage all of you to try to get a test ride on one. Try to understand the experience of this bike. It's a special, unique model. I'm so happy that Roa Enfield brought it here to the US and is building this bike and has been successful with it. It's a special bike and I truly, truly love it. I hope this review was useful. If it was, please support Big Rock Motor and there's ways to do that in the description below. Other than that, please ride safe and I'll see you out there.